Meeting will come to order. Thanks everyone for coming. Uh, Alicia, do we have a quorum, please? Yes, sir. Council Member Contreras is present. Council Member Van Zandt is present. Council Member Runningbaum is absent. Mayor Moss is here. Council Member Young is present. And Council Member Crummel is present. Would you all rise and join me in a moment of silence, please? Thank you. Join me in the pledge, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, we've got a proclamation here. Coach Buck said he wanted to get home to see law and order. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas the city of Willow Park, Texas, would like to recognize the Alito High School Bearcats varsity football team for winning the 2020 Conference 5A Division II Texas State Championship. And whereas the Alito High School football team won its third consecutive state championship and its tenth all-time state championship title, which is a new record in the University Interscholastic League 100 year history. And whereas this, whereas this team exhibits not only outstanding athletic abilities, but scholastic abilities also, as 19 team members were named to the academic all-state team, and six team members were named to the academic all-district team. And whereas the team has demonstrated exceptional teamwork and character that provides examples for others to emulate, and whereas the City of Willow Park City Council wishes to congratulate the Lido Bearcats varsity football team Coach Tim Buchanan and his entire staff on their accomplishments in a year of unparalleled challenges posed by the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, therefore, I, Doyle Moss, Mayor of the City of Willow Park, along with the Willow Park City Council, to hereby recognize the Alito High School football team, Coach Buchanan and his staff for achieving, achieving such success. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> We've heard it nine times already. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we'll move on to public comments. We have public comment from Ms. KJ Hanna. Ms. Hanna, you have five minutes. Council member and neighbors, I'm KJ Hanna. I live at Meadow Place Estates in Willow Park. My fellow uh, citizens of Meadow Place Estates have asked for an update from the Building and Standards Board regarding the serene bankruptcy houses and lots in our neighborhood. There are two what can only be described as abandoned houses left from the 15 serene bankruptcy buildings. Of the 13 bankruptcy homes that have been sold all during 2020, the average price was $116 a square foot. In comparison, the 17 homes that were stock in homes or KW homes or resale averaged $145 a square foot. The average of all 30 homes sold in 2020 was dragged down by the bankruptcy homes to $132 a square foot. As an aside, just this week, one of the abandoned houses on Melbourne had a large um, garbage bin delivered to the property and men started pulling out drywall which had been open to, the, to the, in, uh, the elements for over two years. Regarding the two abandoned houses, have the owners been given a deadline to either finish or demolish the existing construction? What are the deadlines? What happens when a deadline is missed? Are there additional inspections that will confirm these houses are up to code, even behind the rotted walls? How can the city keep this from happening again in a new development? Is there a condition or requirement that should be included for developers to take responsibility for due diligence on the builders they choose? There were 11 vacant lots left by the uh, Serene bankruptcy. Stock and built on three with an average of $145 a square foot. That leaves eight lots that are muddy, weedy messes, tended by the city or by the owner only every few months. Regarding the lots, do the current lot owners have a deadline to build houses or to sell the lots to someone who will? 
Could the city have an agreement with the developer with a deadline for completing all the houses in the development, or can the lots remain vacant for an indefinite period of time? Is there a way the city can require the lot owners to keep the lots maintained to a standard which the rest of the neighborhood has to keep? Or perhaps the city will consider making a couple of lot owners an offer they can't refuse and give our neighborhood the green space that was originally required in the developer's agreement with the city before the, the council decided to let the developers build houses on our original green space in trade for a big hole in the ground outside the neighborhood all the way at the corner of Meadow Place Drive and Kingsgate Drive, which is not included for development in the current Master Parks plan. Of course, these questions cannot be answered now, but when Mr. Grimes asked for topics to be considered for future council, council meetings, will one of our council members please ask for us what's happened? Thank you very much. Item number A is approved council minutes of the February 23rd meeting. Do we have a motion, please? I'll make a motion to approve council, me uh, council meeting minutes. Do we have a second? Second. Any other questions or discussion? All in favor? Thank you. Item number one of regular agenda items to consider and act on an, or, on an ordinance to cancel a May 1, 21, 2021 general election. Mr. Grimes. Um, Alicia, you want to brief the council on the process? <clears throat> yes, sir. Since all races were unexpo unexposed, since <laughs> all races were unopposed, we need to do an ordinance to cancel the May general election. Do we have that ordinance or do we just need a motion? I don't need to read the... Okay, someone's got it there to read. Do you want me to read it? Please. An ordinance of the City Council of the City of Willow Park, Texas, ordering the cancellation of the general election scheduled for May 1st, 2021, declaring the unopposed candidates for three at-large City Council members to be... Yes, to be elected to office, directing the city secretary to take certain actions pertaining to the cancellation of the general election, providing a separability clause, providing an effective date, and providing an open meetings clause. Do we have a motion to adopt the ordinance? I'll make a motion to uh, approve, or excuse me, to... Uh, Adopt the ordinance 827-21 as read. Do we have a second? Second. Any other questions or discussion? All in favor? Thank you. Item number two, consider to consider and act on the resignation of planning and zoning committee member Joe Lane and the appointment of Scott Smith, alternate member to the position. Mr. Grounds? <coughs> Uh, we received uh, Joe's uh, letter of resignation uh, from the PNZ, and we have contacted the alternate Scott Smith to uh, to be appointed. I believe Mr. Smith agreed um, to join the PNZ in a full full capacity, and staff uh, strongly recommends uh, Mr. Smith's appointment. Do we have a motion? I'll make a motion that we accept the resignation of Joe Lane and appoint uh, Scott Smith to the Planning and Zoning Commission. Second. Second. Any other questions or discussion? All in favor. Thank you, Joe, for your service, and thank you, Scott, for serving. Item number three, to consider and act on donating fire department surplus equipment. Mr. Lenore. Good evening, Mayor and Council and citizens. Uh, We've got quite a bit of surplus equipment at Station 2 that we're needing to, to get rid of. Uh, I've got you an itemized list of everything that we had on there. What I'm wanting to do is to donate this to the Emergency Support Service International Group. It's a 501c3 group out of Johnson County in Cleburne. Team Phoenix is stationed out of there, and what they do, they seek donated equipment, and they take to Mexico, and they train uh, Mexico firefighters and uh, with this equipment and everything. So they get the, the surplus <coughs> equipment, the, uh, for us, expired bunker gear, uh, the uh, the two old jaws set that we have, the old, old exhaust fans, 
they train them on how to use it and they utilize it in in their system and so we're not it's just sitting there collecting dust and kind of ready to clean house and get rid of that equipment very good do they take come get it or do we take it to them they come get it very so good. there's a, a group of firefighters that come they'll pick it up and they'll take it down very good do we have a motion make a motion approving the donating and surplus equipment to the emergency services support uh, as listed second second any other questions or discussion for mike the chief all in favor thanks chief thank you all thank you item number four to consider and act on capital improvements funding presentation by hilltop <laughs> securities and staff mr grimes um, at previous council meetings and um, <clears throat> just having some conversations with you guys, we've had a number of discussions about capital improvements um, that need to take place across the, the community. And um, uh, to that end, I had Eric Maha run a number of scenarios to give us a, a deep dive, if you will, into how we can fund some of these capital improvements. Um, I'll let Eric, as he makes his way up, um, we're, we've concentrated on a couple of things. One, certificates of obligation. Two would be a general obligation bond. Generally speaking, as, as some of you guys may know and some of y'all may not, um, a CO is, is basically council issued debt without voter approval. A general obligation bond would be something that would go to the voters. Um, the soonest, you, the earliest you could do a general obligation bond would be November of 21. And so um, with that in mind and with that context, I'll let Eric kind of game play, uh, you know, run the scenarios that we discussed. Keep in mind, um, at some point, you're gonna hear what's called the rate cliff that uh, Jake and Eric and I have been discussing for a number of months. And I think you guys need to be advised of what's gonna happen to your tax rate in about five or six years. So Eric. Sure. Good evening, Mayor, Council, as mentioned, Eric Maha with Hilltop. And there are a few items, I believe, in your packet. And uh, Mr. Grimes touched on the timing, and, and we have two separate items on calendars. I can maybe touch on those last. Um, but I did uh, want to start maybe with the packet of numbers. Uh, there's probably five or six uh, pages to that packet. Uh, the, the first page is labeled summary. And as Mr. Grimes mentioned, we were asked to put together some analysis um, for various project sizes and, and timing estimates on those projects. And that does play into the type of debt that could be issued. Um, as Mr. Grimes mentioned with COs, cities can issue COs at any point in the year. You just have to go through the established process of doing the 45 day notice and uh, selling the debt and closing it. So it's, it's probably a 90 day process for issuing COs from start to finish um, in, in that sense. Now general obligation bonds are, you know, are tied to the to um, uniform election date. So every May or November, cities can hold the bond election. And uh, you'll see in the calendar that this year, the window to call for a November 21st election, um, cities have a certain window, school districts do not. So the window this year is between August 4th and August 16th. So any decisions to put an item on the November ballot would have to be made prior or during that window. <coughs> council. And so, and that, that leads into the numbers. Uh, you'll see labeled on the summary page, we looked at a few different project sizes. We looked at four million. Um, we have it labeled road construction, but you know that could be other capital projects. Um, and we also have a 12 million scenario and a 15 million. And then within each of those scenarios, we looked at different timing. And so anytime you see, for example, on the summary page where we have delivery date, uh, for example, schedule one uh, delivered this June, uh, what that means is the city could issue the debt and then set the tax rate for the next year, fiscal 22 in that sense. So anything issued prior to the time the city would set its tax rate this August, September, um, that, that, that bond payment would be the following year. Anything after September of this year would fall into the following year, fiscal 23 in these schedules. And so uh, when you see the tax and tax listed to the far right, uh, keep that in mind. Depending on when that debt is issued, that's when that tax rate would kick in for that additional debt. So as I mentioned, uh, Schedule 1, we've assumed $4 million issued this June. A 20-year repayment, as mentioned about the, the fiscal cliff, if you will, if we turn to Schedule 1, the next page, and all of the schedules are laid out very similar. I'll go through some of the assumptions. 
Um, for example, Schedule 1, uh, Column B, those are the property value assumptions that we're using in the analysis. And uh, you may recall these look very similar to, to prior uh, schedules we prepared for the city. Um, starting with the uh, city's base value, currently about $650 million, and growing at 1.5% a year uh, there out. So if values exceed projections, then that would lower the tax rate and vice versa. And so those are the value projections. Column D, um, th those are the existing bond payments, existing certificate payments, all supported from INS. Um, the city has other debt service supported from utility revenues, but this is strictly in column D, uh, the existing debt payments from INS. As Mr. Grimes mentioned, if you notice in 2026, it's kind of smaller, or hard to read, but column D, there, there's quite a, a drop in, in that INS supported tax uh, debt service from about 1.7 million down to 890,000 starting in 2027. So all of these schedules have kept that in mind to where we've deferred some of the payments on any new debt to accommodate those existing payments. And then starting in 2027, the, the city uh, generates quite a bit of capacity uh, for, for new projects. So it's just a matter of getting from here to that point in time with our new, new structure in order to keep that tax rate as low as possible. To, to Eric's point real quick, if you don't mind. Yes, I ran um, uh, I ran my own little spreadsheet Leon, Leon uh, let me, pokes fun at me for, for messing with Excel as much as I do. But um, right now, your interest in sinking debt is about 26.2682. <clears throat> and in 2026, your, your interest in sinking payment or debt rate, excuse me, will be 0.1985. Then the cliff hits and that, that interest in sinking rate drops to 0.0752. That's just a best guess based off of what we expect values to be at. So the reason you have this cliff is a couple of things. You want stability in your rate. Um, if you drop off that cliff and you go from 19 to 7, um, eventually you're going to issue debt again. Um, you're, it's just inevitable that you're going to have to do it which means that rate's going to go back up from 7 to maybe 19 or whatever, depending on what you do. And so what we try to do, and I think Jake would agree, and I think Eric would agree from a, from a standpoint, is you want to try to have that cliff be more of a gentle fall than just a jump off point, if you will. Um, we can lower the tax rate, but I don't know, I don't, would never advise going from 19 to 7 and then back up to 20. I think you can structure this in certain ways. Am, am I I'm getting some funny looks from? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so that's, you know, you, you have that capacity, um, but you also, that capacity is related to your rate as well. The best guess I got is if you kept the, if you kept the tax rate the same, 0.2682, in 2026, you would have half a million dollars of debt you could add in that year. Not total debt, just one year's worth. In 2027, that jumps to 1.5 million of just one year of debt. In 2027, uh, excuse me, 2028, it drops to one and three quarter million, or goes up to one and three quarter million. So you are. You know, you, that, when he talks about capacity, that's what we're talking about. And that's if you, you know, we, we talked about when we set the rates last, you know, try to keep the same. And if you keep 0.2682, you're going to have tons of capacity moving forward. Clearly, we don't need, I don't think, I mean, you, you don't need a million and a half bucks of capacity in a single year. So you want to try to average those things out. To give you an idea, next year you'll have 123,000. But by 27, you'll have 1.5 million. That's exactly right, and we we showed 20 and 30 years, and that really, as you meant, that really doesn't <clears throat> new all situation. Once we get past that 2026 mark, going 20 or 30 years, you all could afford the 20 years without impact to the tax rate. And so we showed the 30 years just for illustration, but realistically, once we get past 26, there's quite a bit of capacity on the INS side, and so. Um, these schedules are designed to show that. And the other thing, if values, like I mentioned earlier, do exceed what is 
one, one and a half we're showing here, that you know you have some surplus. And we, we see a lot of cities, and we always keep an eye on this, um, there's the ability to maintain that tax rate unchanged and take that surplus revenue and pay off bonds early. Um, and so the city's existing debt, mm -hmm. there's some call dates on those bonds coming in the next few years that, um, you know, let's say values do increase and you can choose to keep that tax rate unchanged and pay off debt early and save on interest costs. So that's always an option as well. Uh, we like to maintain that flexibility uh, when we structure debt. But no, you're exactly right. Um, through the next five, six years, um, there's thin amount of capacity, but after that time, that's where it generates. And I think most of the issues that we have, to, to, to your point of a refund, which would be a refi at a, at a later date, I think the issues that we that we'll have available at that point, the interest rates are going to be so low, I just don't know if it'd be worth it to, you'd be refining at the higher interest rate. Yeah, and, and you probably wouldn't. I, I think in this case, you'd probably just take that surplus cash and just pay it off. Yeah. 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 That's Make an additional principal payment. So that's, that's another option. Yeah. So what if we find ourselves in a 2008 bubble burst, just hypothetically speaking? Yeah. I mean, that that's why we try to be a little conservative on our estimates. Um, these are backed by the city's tax pledge. So to the extent values were to decrease, then the city would be obligated to raise that tax rate to support it. So. The numbers you run, though, is off of a 1.5%? 1.5% growth each year. Okay. Yes. But if we do have a decline, and we saw it in the Metroplex back in 08, 09, 010, a lot of communities saw that dip. So you would be obligated to raise that tax rate in those cases. And also, we have the ability to restructure debt. I mean, mm -hmm. that, that's always plan B in our mind. We, when we do these type of schedules, mm -hmm. we always look, well, how much principal is in a year, in year five, in case we do have a downturn? Uh, we maybe would have to carve out that payment and reduce it to the one year. Do you recall what that, that uh, reduction was for those communities back in 08 and 09? Every community has been pretty different. In terms of property values, mm -hmm. we, we saw... You know, we saw some 10% decline. I think mostly in the Metroplex, this has been 10 years ago, I, I think you saw one to 2% decline. It, it wasn't that dramatic. I know you go further out west and you can get into mineral values and things, you see more fluctuations. But mm -hmm. you all being more residential, and uh, a, a lot of the residential communities didn't see the large hit um, beyond 2% from what I recall. So, so I that's in your calculus then, as I see here. Yes, we always go back historically and look, you know, what have values grown from year to year over the last 10 years and so on. And so I, we've, we've used historically for Willow Park that one and a half figure mm -hmm. for a number of years now. And, and you've outperformed that over the last five or six years. I think we'll outperform it. I mean, I think you'll outperform it this year easily. I think to your point, it's what happens in 25 and 26 and 27. Yeah. And I, I actually have, for example, I'll just would like I have the history back to 2014. In 2014, 370 million, uh, four, 414 million the next year. 2016, 430, 490, 518, 612, and then now we're at 650. Uh, but that doesn't go back to 2010, Mark. But, sure, and I know that was, you know, but no, you're exactly right. That that's something we always have to buy on values. Eric, um, I have one question. So I, you've got a lot of the schedules here, assuming $4 million debt issuance, various ways, uh, 12, 15. Um, and in looking at it, <coughs> your little green box, um, that's the calculated INS tax rate. Yes. Um, do you have, did you, I, I know it's not in front of us, but the scenario of no debt issuance, what with this very conservative 1.5% growth, because it does show, and I'm assuming that's with issuance, we we are would be expected if we issued it to go up to 2.705 this year. Um, so I'm curious, without doing anything, do you have that right? I, I didn't. It would, okay. It's going to be very similar to what Mr. Price mentioned. For example, let's uh, take maybe 2025 that year, 1.68 million. Uh huh. About 24.8 cents, and that's in 2025 with no debt. Okay. So 
they're going from 26.8 to 24.8, so about a two penny decline. Decline, I would say, okay. Yes, in the next four or five years. Okay. Without having to do that. Yeah. Is that pretty similar? What? Yeah. I had, I had 23 cents. Is that on your spreadsheet? Yes. That I have? Okay. The, the, there's a, the reason, and this is where I'm going to get, I'm not going to look over here at her because she's heard this and she's cautioned me not to say it, but the reason there's a discrepancy is that we have what's called a frozen tax levy. So it's a 65 and older tax exemption. And the way it works is that we get a, a just a pile of, of levy that's split between the m and and the interest in sinking. And so we don't know what that number is it changes from year to year but typically that number has gone up about eight percent every year over the last 10 years and so when and, and that impacts our interest in sinking because uh it's an injection of a hundred for this year it'll be an injection of one hundred eighty six thousand dollars of cash in, outside of what we charge on the rate well that's about a 10 percent injection of cash into our total into our total levy. So that number kind of skews this this tax rate a little bit. So if he comes out with 24, I come out with 23, there's the reason why. And it's something that Jake and I, we go round and round every, every July when the number comes out. So we don't really know what it's gonna be, but we have a pretty good formula, to, pretty good estimate on it. And the other thing that drives that is collection percentage as well. Yeah. That's, you're gonna see some difference. He, he comes off, do you have a collection? We use 98% in most cases. Uh, 98 and a half, so. That's what I'm skewed a little bit. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? So I, I, I guess from a staff standpoint, you know, we've talked about how you fund these things. The question becomes, what projects, if any, do we want to look at? Um, you know, do you want to, what's council's pleasure on some of these things? Because you know what the issues are, there's streets, we have some parks needs that we want to do, we've got a city hall that we're looking to, to fund as well. Um, I mean, what do you think? I think the other question is when. What do you want and when? I think that's the biggest looking at that projection over the next five to six years, the when is probably a bigger factor to me than the what. Okay. The city hall needs to be near the top of the list. Uh, conditions here are not good and not getting any better. Uh, I'd like to see us, uh, don't we have something coming up with the architects? Yes, we have a, we hired Jacob and Morton at the last meeting um, we have a kickoff meeting with the City Hall Committee uh, on January, or sorry, not January, March 31. Um, and we'll do, we'll start the needs assessment on that date. Um, just generally speaking, and this is not having any consultation with the architect whatsoever, um, but if you did a $4 million uh, note uh, for 30 years, you could do that with a minimal uh, tax rate increase. When I say minimal, I'm talking 0 0.002. Um, you would finance your city hall over 30 years just like you would a mortgage on a home. So you could do city hall, you know, when the needs of, when the city hall committee comes back with a recommendation, you could do that and not raise the tax rate. I'm comfortable with that. The difference between that and a 20-year note is obviously the 10 years of, of difference that you've got. I'd like to let's see us consider that and see where that takes us. And we're 60 or 90 days away from that and see what happens. Is that right? We're Yeah, we're probably a little bit more than 60 to 90. Whatever. But Yeah, I'll, and I'll say just looking at your numbers on that, um, you're still looking at a huge debt capacity after that. That doesn't really affect the overall debt cliff in 2027 of, you know, mm -hmm. that doesn't stop us from doing any other projects. Yes. And that's a good point. If maybe schedule, let me see, maybe schedule four in the packet might be helpful in that sense. Schedule four, that's the, the largest issue size that we've shown here tonight, the 15 million. 
and you'll notice column J on schedule four, if we go out to 2027, you can see even at that point in time, the debt service drops, it's declining uh, starting in 2027. So that shows us that there is still capacity even at issuing 15 million. Right. Uh, today's you know, environment. Yeah, I was gonna say, I think Brian, I had looked at some numbers and we go from, you know, up to almost one point two. Well, we the his rate difference. You have that as the same rate, but we yeah. it's quite a bit of capacity, you know, yeah. that that we'd still have because of the thirty year note. So I think that is attractive, you know, as uh, the mayor is mentioning, that's attractive to be able to to start something, and because we can finance that over thirty years, it doesn't stop us from looking at roads. You know, in a couple of years, a geo or whatever we think we can do for a road package, parks, things like that. I think it still gives us the option in, in a couple of years to look at some other ideas. So I like that. And I would also, just from a timing standpoint, if you wanted to go down the route of a city hall and a CO, um, I think Jake would probably agree with me on this one. You don't want to issue debt in August or, or even September. You want to issue it in the next, next fiscal year because you get that whole other year of value and you don't have the big payment for another 18 months and you can issue debt in october theoretically if we issue debt in october of 21 we wouldn't have a big payment until february of 23. correct and so you've got two years of value increases before your first big payment comes well and we're looking at that anywhere before at mm -hmm. that time anywhere mm -hmm. before the season right yeah. i was gonna say the schedule for us getting anything yeah. from the yeah. architect was right. similar so yeah very good any other questions? Good stuff. Thank you. All right. Item number five, review and update from Winter Storm in February 2021. Um, last week, we had a tabletop. Thank you, Eric. Thank Thanks, you, Eric. Jake. Thanks, Eric. Thank you. Um, we, had a, we did a tabletop exercise with department heads, kind of recapping, and, and Council Member Contreras was there as well. Um, kind of recapping uh, how the winter storm impacted city services. Uh, we tried to put a, a fiscal cost to it as well as some other factors. Um, so I'll let whoever lost in rock, paper, scissors, either Mike or Carrie can come up and... Um... <laughs> <laughs> Apparently Carrie did. How detailed would you like? Summary. <laughs> yes, sir. So quickly, overall, um, the best thing is nobody got hurt. Um, we had no damage to city equipment. We maintained all of our staffing levels, and we incurred a lot of overtime. Um, the overtime we incur will deplete our overtime budget. We had $6,660 to cover shifts, and we had an additional $2,917 in overtime to staff the warming center at Christ Chapel. Um, we have some noted concerns about some communication issues regarding the warming centers, um, and I think that's a conversation for another time. Um, that's true, <laughs> and we are having those conversations. Yes, sir. Overall, the, the, the fiscal cost is about $9,577. Okay. When we go to a church like that, is that something of public service? Is that something the church pays, or how, is that, how does that work? No, that was all of our budget. That was, it was, that a, was, public, it was a public safety concern for I'm with you. Okay, I didn't know. Yes, okay. it was all in the city. Okay. Anything else from PD? Biggest all challenge was trying to get people here, I guess, not missing shifts and... You know, we actually had no problems with people expressing concerns about getting to work. I mean, all of the admin was there as we were, you know, it's our shift, we're supposed to be there. We had no, nobody try to call in and us force them to be there. They, they knew where their job was and they knew where they were needed. And they showed up without hesitation and without complaint. Very good. That's a tribute to you. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Sure. Chief Lenore. We ended up running 49 calls 
uh, in one week, Friday to Friday. So Friday, the start of the cold to when we opened everything back up. Uh, we normally average about 66 calls in a month. So we were pretty busy. Uh, a lot of water breaks. We helped out Public Works with shutting off uh, residential lines, commercial lines. Uh, we lost almost all of our fire suppression system and everyone had to go on fire watch. So uh, restoring those systems has taken a while. We still have some businesses that still aren't up yet because of uh, using uh, PVC piping for the fire suppression system in the residential uh, communities. So those systems are still down, they're still on fire watch. Uh, quite a few buildings have to go through, so I expect them to be another weeks to, to a month. Uh, staffing issues, we had the normal crews respond as normal. Uh, the three administration people came in, we worked extra shifts covering extra, extra trucks, responding to calls. That was pretty much the extent of the fire department. Uh, we housed Life Care EMS because they were out of power. And uh, so we had two ambulances in the bay and uh, cooked some extra meals. So, but uh, other than that, it, it went relatively smooth. Now you, if you have a generator there, correct? Yes, sir. So, and that powers your entire? It powers the entire uh, public safety building. Diesel? It's, it's a natural gas. So. Was that an issue? Not, not for us. Uh, with, I think it. Uh, as soon as power cycled, it kicked right on, and I really don't even think we knew that power had shut off for us. So our system's pretty, pretty efficient and quick. Good. That's great. We appreciate the job you all did. Also, thanks, sir. Thank you. I know that she's running command central back there uh, from a communication standpoint um, you know Rose did a great job of, of working out of her home in mineral wells uh, not being here and and feeding information we kind of became a, a hub of where we could of where we could get stuff and became our communications department uh, which is good because she's the communications director um, she you know put out a lot of rumors um, in times of panic in times of crisis Shut down rumors, not put out. Yeah, put out the fire of a lot of. <laughs> thank you. She put out. Yeah, thank you for the correct. <laughs> well, she is a PIO, so <laughs> um, she shut down a lot of rumors, a lot of mis, a lot of bad information got put out there. Um, I think the most common thing was when's this, when's the city going to turn my water back on? And of course, that's when you had to tell them we never turned it off, um, and had to go through that. Um, I know that she reached out and, and uh, actually the county reached out. I think she helped them with some of their comms as well. Um, and, you know, we had good reach. The messaging got out to people. Um, I think we've all decided as a staff that we will never go to Facebook and tell people to conserve water. Um, the minute you do that, the tower started draining. So um, that's, a, that's a lesson we're going to take uh, and move forward with. Uh, but I want to commend her as well. She did a great job. She was in mineral wells, and so she, she really did a good job here in, in, in taking care of us here in Willow Park. Um, up next, I'll let Michelle and Chase kind of talk about public works. This is the big, um, this is the one that, this is the department that was really out there. And when I mean out there, I'm literally in every sense of the word. So Chase, go ahead. All right, a brief timeline overview. Uh, Monday morning on the 15th at 2.30 a.m., our phones started ringing. We lost power to two of our three lift stations. One lift station, which is off Kingsgate, it transferred, switched over generator power with no problem. Beavers Creek, on the other hand, did switch over and the generator ran for about an hour and shut down completely. Luckily, Jim Martin was able to supply us a generator. We were able to manually tie into one pump and manually run that pump 24 seven until power was fully restored. Um, now the water side. Real quick, when you say manually run the pump, you're talking about guys out there. Yes, we had one gas station there throughout the day. Just you're having to flip a breaker on and off, and then it, in the evening times, I stationed two there to at least give someone time to sleep through two or three hours. 
because they had it down on a timer. They could probably they could roughly run that pump about 45 minutes before they pump it too low to damage the pump or to get too high to cause any problems. Because they timed it pretty good. But yes, they were there. So we had two guys sleeping in a truck. Or one was sleeping. But one sleep, yeah. They both got <laughs> it out of his sleep. We had two guys in the truck, one sleeping. <laughs> yes. At Beaver's Creek, mm -hmm. the low spot, Beaver's Creek, by the way, is that area below, between the chamber, just east of the chamber. Yeah, it was uh, pretty interesting. Um, on the hic um, the sewer plant itself, no hiccups there, never lost power because we were on Tri-County. Had a few icing on top of the sludge blankets and stuff like that, but no problems there. The water side, on the other hand, is where it got real hairy for a short time. Monday the 15th, 2.30 a.m., we lost power to 17 of 18 well and pump station locations. So we were down El Chico on the north side of the interstate was the only one, or the south side, I apologize, of the only one that stayed in power and that doesn't produce a whole lot. Luckily, power came back on between 4 and 4.30 that morning. So it gained us power back to 10 locations, which was all around our shop. So all the lake wells kept pushing, so we were able to keep pushing water from there. And Fox Hunt did regain power at th that time. The tower on the trend, the transducer, which reads our level in the tower at Fox Hunt, froze at roughly 10 o'clock Sunday evening. And we were out there for probably three hours trying to get it unthawed. We got it unthawed, but the calibration took roughly 18 to 20 hours before I was actually able to accurately read what was in our tower. Um, when that calibration is off, basically you're flying blind. You don't yes, because the, the tower actually at one point in time hit negative 60 feet and hit over 120 feet of water, which the 120 feet would have been awesome. But <laughs> So you didn't know how much water you had in the tower? No. That's a hard way to run a system. Yeah. We could roughly gauge it off the tower at ground storage. Typically, when you look at that tower by our pressure planes, you can kind of somewhat guesstimate what you have. It's when our tower there really starts to fall is when you know Fox Hunt gets low because it's really starting to suck water from that side of town to downtown, which is our heavier usage area. And we did eventually have to shut ground storage off, I believe, Wednesday. Was, was there Thursday? Wednesday. Wednesday. Sometime Wednesday evening, we had to shut that tower completely off to completely force everything downtown that we had at the time. Um, so we were still down, we were down seven plants for 41 hours. Then power was fully restored to all plants roughly eight o'clock on the 16th. So it was between 40 and 41 hours, they were completely out of power. We were able to secure a generator from the city of Weatherford, which was a really saving grace because we were able to hotwire well nine location down off Ranch House. We were able to keep one well and one pump running 24 seven, which is our, we use the highest producing well and with those pumps, the tank never, tank level very seldom varied and the pump stayed running, which really kept pushing water downtown, keeping the pressure up where we needed it, keeping the level somewhat steady for the most part. Um, once power was fully restored, that's when we kicked in over overdrive, really thawing out these plants. I have one, uh, one well side I had to nearly completely replumb the well line, which was easier than trying to thaw it out. Um, the south of the interstate, uh, we lost power there for 41 hours. The tower luckily was completely full when that happened. It self-sustained until the 17th, or the early morning of Wednesday the 17th is when their pressure dropped. So then the full water notice was issued. We got everything thawed out, pump stations and everything were up operational and the wells were. So we started, we got the wells up and running, made sure the tanks and everything were filling properly and then we fired up one pump at one location and alternated so we didn't overload the system. We started filling that tower at 6.30 on Thursday. Took roughly 14 to 16 hours, just babying it, trying to slowly fill it so we didn't cause any more problems. It took roughly 14 to 16 hours to completely top off at our 27 foot and shut the pumps themselves off to where it would start running back automatically. At that time, we were able to get the sample taken and delivered to our lab. They, we successfully passed the bacteriological sample 
and the, then the boil water notice was rescinded on the 20th. That, so other than the boil water notice, we were pretty much self-sustaining back by Friday mid-morning, other than a few little knickknacks, a couple of lake wells that we were still thawing, but we were fully back up operational Friday morning. So that was pretty much a brief overview of Appreciate what you what we went through. <laughs> Appreciate what you guys did. Thank you. And ladies. Thank you, Chase. So just quickly, to give y'all kind of a brief overview of what this ended up taking, just the hourly employees put in 681 hours during that week um, on an average cost of about $17 per hour for them, cost us $11,585. Um, we still haven't got all our bills, and it's going to cost us somewhere between twenty and 25000 by the time this is all said and done. Um, we are working to, we identified some issues. We're going to start fixing them now. Um, Derek and I will be meeting with Jacob and Martin's electrical engineer on Thursday. <clears throat> and we're going to see about what generators we need to get put in at key locations to make sure that we keep electricity at all the websites. And then we're also working to identify locations that need, as silly as it sounds, 120 volt plugs um you don't have plugs nearby it makes it kind of hard to try to thaw stuff back out right so and we're going to work on getting heat trace put on all those wells so y'all have questions for me do you have a budget for electric blankets <laughs> <laughs> no but that, that, considering how well that worked we may have to right so that was the funniest thing yeah. have you received your electric blanket yet it's out in my truck. Michelle said, it, <laughs> Michelle said it's in the mail. We 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 acquisitioned at at yeah we acquisitioned the mayor's electric blanket we, to thaw out the wells. We also acquisitioned two hair dryers, I believe, <laughs> and two heat guns. And two heat guns. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, I, I appreciate what you all did. I really do. Kept I'll, things kept things moving. I want to commend them for their creativity on how to solve these. It was kind of funny to, to watch Chase and Nathan, you're at a well site and they're going, how do we, how do we thaw this, unthaw this, it's a big block of ice. And I mean, it, they were creative. And he, he calls me up, he says, you know anybody's got an electric blanket? I said, I know the mayor does. <laughs> you didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, I had a good idea. But, uh, um, these guys, it could have been easy to, you know, after 36 hours, just, to, you know, and everything's just not going your way. It's easy to throw in the towel and say we're done and, and just let the system fall down. And we did lose Willow Springs Oaks. But by and large, you know, uh, I want to applaud Chase and his guys and Michelle for, for really coming in, doing yeoman's work, and, and uh, uh, great job. Great job. Thank you. I'd just like to just add, um, I, I would like the whole staff, uh, Brian Grimes kept, I was updated two or three times a day. I know the mayor was updated. Um, it just worked like it's supposed to. They did their jobs. Brian told us what was going on, if decisions needed to be made or whatever. Everybody was communicating beautifully. I think uh, the whole staff operated absolutely great. Now, I wasn't out there in the field trying to thaw pipes, but... Um, but I did hear about it each day. So, um, but I appreciate very much that everybody from top to bottom worked together to make everything work well. So thank you. Very good. Thank you. Item number seven. Uh, number six. Oh, number six, six. I'm sorry. To consider an act on a resolution continuing and extending the mayor's declaration of a local state of disaster caused by severe winter weather. Pat. Yes, mayor and council your packet. Uh, did you see uh, mayor Moss? Because of that severe winter storm declared a local state of disaster for the city of Little Park. Uh, that was encouraged by TDM to make sure that we get all resources, state and federal, that may be, that may be available to us. So he did that on the 2nd, and uh, it will expire today if you don't extend it. And so in your packet is the resolution that extends that uh, declaration through the end of the month. Um, basically, we have some deadlines. I emailed you, Brian, about if we're going to seek any kind of 
FEMA reimbursement. Mm -hmm. We have to register with them by the 21st. So if there's any infrastructure damage, things like that, that we want to make reimbursement for, we'll need to sure. get on that. And that's what that's what this resolution does. It gives us enough time to put together those kinds of, and to make sure we get all the costs we can. So okay. we recommend you, you pass it. Do we have a motion, please? I'll make a motion that we approve a resolution of the City Council of the City of Willow Park continuing and extending the Mayor's declaration of a local state of disaster in the City of Willow Park caused by severe winter weather. Do we have a second? Second. Any other questions or discussion? All in favor? Thank you. Item number seven, to consider and act, to consider and act on crediting water bills in the amount of 2,000 gallons due to the February 2021 winter storm. Mr. Grimes. So um, the city managers in, in Parker County, uh, Weatherford, Hudson Oaks, uh, Willow Park, Alito, um, we started having conversations about crediting water bills um, uh, to kind of mitigate and offset some of these costs for our customers. Um, um, I think Sterling did this two weeks ago. I know Weatherford follows suit soon after, and Alito passed a similar resolution last week. Um, the way our billing cycle works is it's not going to be, obviously, for the bills that just went out, but this will be for the next billing cycle. Um, and so um, staff strongly recommends that, that we try to uh, help mitigate some of the, the cost, of the, at least on water, uh, for, uh, for these customers. Do we have a motion, please? I'll make a motion to uh, approve crediting water bills in the amount of 2,000 gallons due to the February 2021 winter storm. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion or questions? All in favor? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Item number eight, to consider an act on authorizing staff to submit a grant loan application to the USDA for equipment purchase and acquisition. Mr. Grimes. USDA has a number of programs um, that we can purchase equipment for to help mitigate these this, this type of uh, disaster in the future, namely generators. Um, I'm not as optimistic as I, as I once was about getting a grant. Quite frankly, our, our household income values are just a little bit too high. But they do have low interest loans that we can use for supply of generators. Um, at the tabletop, Michelle discussed we may need as many as 10 uh, generators at a cost of about $75,000 apiece. So that's obviously $750,000. Um, and that's just for the generators. That doesn't include heat trace and some of the other things that we're, we may need. Um, but USDA, has been they have, a, they have a lot of good programs for rural development, which is what we would be considered. Um, all we really need is just a motion to, to approve this. They're going to ask for that in the application, and we'll, we'll submit the minutes of this meeting. Do we have a motion, please? I'll make a motion that we authorize staff to submit a grant loan application to the USDA for equipment purchase and acquisition. Second? Second. Any questions or discussion? All in favor? Thank you. To consider and act on items to be considered for future council meetings, Mr. Grimes. Um, obviously, we have uh, Ms. Hannah's request on there. I'm adding that. If someone uh, has objection to it, let me know. But I've got that request on there. Um, we also have the audit was supposed to be uh, tonight. At the request of the auditors, they wanted to move it to the 23rd. We did tell them, I know you're going to say this, we did tell them we have to have the audit presented by March 31. So um, uh, they are aware of that. And so um, uh, they did not expect it to be a problem to have it in two weeks. Okay. And those are the only two issues that I have. Do we need to uh, seek out a new alternate for PNZ? We will work on that. Do we have any of the... Um, drainage impact fee things that are going through PNC coming up? Yeah, that'll be on the 16th, so we should have um, okay. a draft of, of that report for consideration and approval by council, and then we'll start that process. So I should have, a, I'll send out a timeline of okay. kind of what we anticipate going on. So. Perfect. 
And then we'll also uh, potentially have an update on our Fort Worth water connection. Yes. Kind of. Yes. <coughs> we will absolutely have that. Um, I'll, I'll ask Preston to come in and give an update on where we are with that. Yeah, if y'all have seen the blue pipe that's mm -hmm. along the frontage road, that's our pipe. Um, and so um, I believe I believe they started installing some of it along. Did they start over there off of Micah's already in Hudson Oaks? They started on both ends. On both ends? Mm -hmm. Okay. They haven't bored under Farmer Road, though, yet. No. Yeah. No, that'll be, that'll be one of the later. But they've done several of them. It's going yeah. in. It's going in quick, though. They bored under El Chico already. It'll start to set the bore up, I guess. Yeah, they've done that when they're uh, they were working on Trisha Trail. Mm -hmm. and okay. And I think they worked on one of them down the street. What size pipe is that blue pipe? Uh, well, it depends. It's uh, okay. some twenty-four inch, some eighteen inch, and some sixteen inch on this other. Okay. Okay, anything else for the 20th uh, meeting? No, sir. Okay, setting the date and time for the next council meeting? The 20 23rd, isn't it? Yes, sir. 7 p.m.? Yes, sir. Everyone okay with that? Mm -hmm. The, um, okay, this is 23rd, the 26th, uh, 27th. 27th, yeah. Okay. Ben Hogan? Yes. Yeah, 27th. That's 20. We'll announce that next time. You announce it now. I mean. Sure. 27th, 1030 in the morning, the uh, first team, the Ben Hogan Learning Center will have groundbreaking. So that'll be a big event for the city. It's 1030, 27th, Saturday morning. Be a lot of traffic, and we're working on, working on that. So that will be a, a great addition to the city. I'm excited about that. Lee and I are anyway, aren't we? Yes, we are. <laughs> okay, council meeting. Um, mayor's comments. I'd like to thank Chief West, Chief Lenore, Michelle, Brian, Rose, all the water department, and all their staff for the incredible job they did during this ice storm. And uh, we had a meeting today, which we'll discuss later on, to help deter something like this happening again but that'll be for a later date so i appreciate everyone what they did and their their work any other council member comments mr grimes uh just a few comments um next meeting will be the audit um we're not expecting a whole lot of surprises from the auditor on that one so hopefully that'll, that'll get wrapped up and, and we can get that done um, as you know, Governor Abbott has lifted the, the, the mask ban, and so, um, but still local businesses may be enforcing it. Um, those are decisions of those proprietors, not of the city or the county. Um, we have, um, we'll probably be demolishing the house at 203 El Chico here in the coming probably in the coming months. So, Chief, if you need to do a drill over there or something, sooner is better than later. Um, and then I'm, I'm, I've got a meeting with half set up. Um, we're hopeful to get uh, put the bid out for the storage tank and the pump station here in the coming weeks. That's the last phase. Third, or finally, I guess I should say, we, we've had some good discussions with Fort Worth about getting an agreement uh, papered for the 500,000 gallons over the summertime. Um, we, uh, with with Pat's blessing, and, and he looked at the agreement, we, we did an engagement letter with TOS uh, earlier this week to get that hammered out and help that go through Fort Worth Legal to get that. Uh, it, it was a priority up until February 15th, and then it's not really a priority for them anymore. They, they have a lot more issues to worry about, so we're going to we're going to hire Toast to come in and try to move that thing through. So. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Motion to adjourn. I move we adjourn. Second. Second. Everybody don't look so excited. I <laughs> know. <laughs> All in favor? Thank you, everyone.